So I would like to invite, um, you know, uh, Ms. Uh, Pimparpai uh, Bisaputra to, to speak. Um, you know, she's the author of a few you know, best-selling books and the other co-author of from A History of the Thai Chinese. And uh, she'll be speaking about Chinese ceramics um, in Southeast Asia. And uh, it's a case study of a family collection in Thailand. So Ms. Bisaputra, please. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you for coming and yes, honoring my husband and I. Um, so now, let's move away from war and violence, shall we? <laughs> it's time for the light of heart. Martino has given me 15 minutes to go through 500 years. <laughs> so you'll be on a bullet train. <laughs> so this is... Um, a reflection through porcelain collector. I'm a, a collector myself, and um, my greatest hobby is to fit what I buy with, into contact with history. That's a game all collectors play, and it's fun, you know? And um, so I would like to start with telling you the esoteric aspect of the history of China and Siam as a case example, as a case example of what Jeffrey has told you about tributary trade. Mm -hmm. And the best evidence is in the porcelain shards and the whole porcelain collection from Thailand. Part of it was that Ayutthaya was burned down, so we don't have any written document. The best thing we could do is to give you a portrait of Siam through porcelain. Ayutthaya was founded in the Yuan Dynasty in the year 1350, 18 years later. Hong Wu founded the Ming Empire. When he founded the Ming Empire, he was just a commoner you know, a, a poor person against the Mongol Empire, emperor, who has a network of trade all over the world. So what does a commoner do? What he did was to send envoy to all the Southeast Asia rulers who sent tribute to China. In the UTR, we received an envoy in 1371, which is only three years after he managed to uh, expel the Mongol from uh, China heartland. Now, interestingly, on the same year, what he did was to declare the Ming Ban. What is the Ming Ban? The Ming Ban basically prohibit any Chinese to venture out to sea. So that put a real full stop. If you go out to sea, come back, you get beheaded. So with that, it encouraged all the rulers because he has given them the monopolistic right to trade. The most obvious and the most effective was the king of Siam, which I'll tell you his stories. The envoy arrived in the UTI in um, 1371, Dao Nakhon In was the eldest son of King, um, excuse me, King Baromara Shatirat the first. He was the eldest son. So the king sent his eldest son to China as the first ambassador to the Ming court. Um, Dao Nakhon In was a good trader and he not only goes to Beijing in 1371, before the king of the Sultan of Malacca, before the Sultan of Brunei. All of these people go, but this was one of the first Southeast Asian rulers to travel to China. More than that, he made another visit in 1377. So before Rama V, which reigns in the 19th century. He was the only Thai king who traveled abroad in promotion of trade. Unfortunately, we don't have much of the early Ming ceramics, so I can only give you shards. 
this shard was found in Thailand is an early Ming, beautiful, beautiful monochrome ware. The Barom Rajatira I is a founder of Subhanapum dynasty. The dynasty is the longest reigning dynasty of Ayutthaya. It rules over Ayutthaya for 200 years. In fact, it is the, this dynasty and it is his Jaunakon in Sun who attack Angkor and bring back all the treasure of Angkor to Ayutthaya. So the Khmer doesn't like us, doesn't like this dynasty very much. This is the tomb that Jao Sampraya, Jao Nakon in Sun built for him called Wat Rashaburana. Wat Rashaburana has a gold, um, uh, lots of gold kept in the crypt of Wat Rashaburana. And every time the Queen of Thailand go to New York or London, this would be the collection that she brings. Interestingly to see that the way the Thai gold was set uses the same technique as the early Ming jewelry found in early Ming tomb. So that's another topic which would be interesting to associate. But similarities between these two courts is, uh, is, is something to be noted. However, in the crypt, there was no porcelain kept here. We didn't find any porcelain, just gold and gold and gold and gold artifacts. However, we have a supporting uh, document, which is the Ming Shi Lu, which clearly state that in 1383, Emperor Hongwu sent the kings of the mainland, which are the king of Siam, the king of Jam, Jampa, and the king of Angkor, 19,000 pieces of porcelain each. None of them survived in the mainland Southeast Asia to today. The jam was, of course, destroyed. The anchor also, so is Ayutthaya. So none of these imperial, um, how many, almost 50,000 pieces of imperial porcelain were all destroyed. However, in the crypt of Wat Rajaburana, we have paintings. You know, paintings of the memory of, you know, blue and white Hongwu porcelain painted by his grandson uh, uh, generation because uh, it was built by Jiao Sampriya. So I just compare it to the, um, the early Ming blue and white found in museum. Now we move very quickly because Martino is very short in time. So I'm now at 16th century. <laughs> now what happened in the 16th century is that although the Ming Ban is still on, they could not, um, they could not control the coastline. So the coastline was full of Chinese private junk. If they get caught, you know, the whole crew member would be, would be executed. Would, I mean, in the Ming Sulu, we would tell you that to 26 people of the junk crew was all executed, you know? So in the 16th century, this is an era for the southern Chinese of Canton and Fujian, where heaven is high, if you made it, and the emperor far away, I hope. <laughs> now, as, as my husband here, is very generous. He allowed me to buy this last month. <laughs> it's a it's a Hongju, um, it's a Hongju uh, candy, uh, which I found last month. I'm very pleased with myself. Um, again, you know, Jing is the last emperor that kept the the Ming ban on, because he said, this is the mandate given by his founder of the Ming dynasty. He would not change. He is the last emperor that the Ming ban was on. Now, this big fishbowl is about this big, and I found it. I acquired it, sorry. 
very happy because the same is in the in the museum in Edinburgh in Scotland, this big, and I found it in Thailand. Now the interesting thing why we bought is that it, I, I did a close up there where you can see that this piece is damaged. It's a damaged piece. Now all damaged piece, if it's imperial, would be destroyed at the kiln. But you know the network of junk merchant managed to transport it all the way to Ayutthaya. Uh -huh. that, that is why I have a lot of admiration for this piece, but of course it's not of value because it's, it's a damaged piece. The Ming ban lasted until 1589, so the 17th century is when Jin De Zhen boom because it has customer from overseas. You know, you have overseas customer, you start having the crack where you can export um, to Japan, to Southeast Asia. But the interesting thing about this, you have to look at the people. You have to look at the people who operate the transportation from pirate. They become legalized. So now they become the merchant. You know, the legal merchant, the tycoon, you know? Um, that's why I love this collecting, because it, it does reflect. The map you show on the right is called the Seldom Map Kept in Oxford Library. It is a Chinese map that is attributed to Li Dan. Li Dan is, I mean, Li Dan was the Chinese captain based in Japan. You know, he controlled the trade between China and Japan. But more than that, he controlled trade between China, Japan, and Macau. And he's the boss who, Zhen Zhilong, who started working to him as a ship hand. And uh, Zhen Zhilong uh, was the father of Kosinka. When history talk about Kosinka, they always talk about, you know, this great hero who kicked out the, the Dutch from, from, from Taiwan, from Formosa. They destroyed Fort Landia, Zealandia. Because modern day's history has no time. So you have to learn of the most important act. But if you go and read, history of object or history of porcelain. An academic studying the VOC porcelain found out that the Zhen was the biggest supplier of made-to-order porcelain for Europe because the European cannot go into China. So they can only buy it either in Macau or in, in, in the port, but the port is controlled by the Zhen network. So it was the Zhen, and the Zhen was so good that after they beat the Dutch in a sea war, they, after that, they supplied them the porcelain all the way up to the ship. You know, they would ship it up to the, the Dutch ship. And it's the history of the VOC will indicate to you that all these Karakware, a lot of them are supported, are transported by the Zhen. This is a typical example of what is found in the Chacha Jiang, which is also a Jiang um, that has some attribute to the Zhen, uh, Zhen, Zhen clan. According to the Chinese, the protection of the Zhen cartel is as strong as the Great War. If you Come out, venture out to sea without the Zhen flag, you'll probably be wrong. And that's why the Zhen network consists of 800, 800 ships. You know, equal to Hideyoshi, except that he's not a ruler, a, a political ruler in any sort. Just now it was found in Thailand. Uh, 17th century, you have the fall of the Ming in 1644, and the Ming loyal, royalist fled south. 
everybody wants to fight the Manchu, everybody wants to fight the king. Uh -huh. And everybody, I mean, mostly commoner, Chinese common man. So one of the literature that was written in the Kangxi period, at that time he hasn't pacified the South yet, there was a, 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 a novel written. It is a novel continuation of the water margin. The water margin was written in, in, the, in the Ming Dynasty. But because people in the South were so unhappy with the Qing and the Manchu, they wrote about the, the, the junk network venturing out to sea and hopefully eventually would make good. You know? So this is Water Margin Part 2, written during the Kangxi period. Interesting thing is that the, the, it's not a tragedy because the novel ends with that junk, uh, I mean that pirate or junk master become the king of Siam. So <laughs> everywhere that I give a talk, I would have to see this, you know, Chinese inspiration to become the king of Southeast Asia is always there, is in their mind, mindset. Now let's continue. But the world wasn't bad. I mean, even though the Qing come in, it's a new 17th century mark the new age of Asian king. You have Kangxi, who is an enlightened emperor. You have Narai, who is also an enlightened king of Siam. King Narai is considered by the Thai to be a great king of Ayutthaya. The difference between the two is Kangxi is imprisoned in his own celestial worldview that Jeffrey was talking about, never travel outside of China, or give very much, doesn't care very much about the overseas. But Narai, on the other hand, has sent for embassy uh -huh, to Portugal, to, to France three times, and to uh, London once. The Thai ambassador goes to London. They were asked this question. Is it true that the Chinese leave their homeland because they were forced to have the Manchu hairstyle? Now, news travel fast, right? I mean, you know, we know, we know that our forefathers leave because they were forced to have a Manchu style. You know, Chinese doesn't cut hair. They, I mean, we just, that's so unlucky. Now, the, the, coming back to ceramics, uh, again, history and ceramics go hand in hand, inseparable. The plate on the right is an early Benjerong, and I have been promoting this idea that if you check it, you would find that early Benjerong was made uh, before 1684 because shard of that plate was found in a shipwreck that carried the ambassador of King Narai to Lisbon. And it was shipwreck near Cape Town. And the shipwreck was found a few years back. They found shards of that and the ambassador. And of course, the ambassador doesn't die, didn't die miraculously. He survived, came back to Thailand, and then traveled with Le Lube back to France. And then he, this, this ambassador actually visited the Vatican before he came back. So the Thai, they are very outward looking. They are always outward looking on international trade. The Ming ban has just been lifted. Now the Qing ban is coming. In order to pacify, and beat out the Ming royalists who venture out to sea, of course, just like our water margin heroes. The Xing ban was worse because it not only banned any ship venturing out to sea, but it moved villages by the coastline further. And so many people have died about, some, some history books said five million Chinese has died because of that ban. Mm, which is 
only a 20 year span. Kangxi is a great emperor. Once he has pacified the South, he opened up. He opened up. And again, all those baddies, pirates, and refugees uh, become, were, were allowed to go and trade. In the, in the 17th century, this is where the Chinese live. I mean, this is where they come from. To, and this is where they prosper. So the prosperity of Singapore may be before you dated the Peranakan Ware, because Peranakan Ware only date to 19th, 20th century. But the history of Chinese go far deeper than that. Now you see, this map is very interesting because it is not an accurate map. It's a map that tells you stories. For example, if you go on the right of Vietnam, if you travel on that um, light green, you'll definitely be shipwrecked. The reef opposite, uh, I mean, next to Vietnam, to the east, that don't go into. Now, Vietnam Authority hasn't reached the Mekong Delta. Champa Kingdom was between Vietnam and the Mekong River. So Cham is still there in the 17th century. More important, when the army of the Lloyd Ming royalists traveled down, the king of Vietnam asked them to settle near Hanoi. Okay, that green area in the middle of the Mekong Delta. And that is Chinese, predominantly Ming royalists, 3,000, they come all the way and settle there. So all these are where we overseas Chinese live and prosper. Now, Kangxi, as a, I'm an admirer of Kangxi, uh, so after he have put down the three judiciary uh, revolt, he went back to Jintajan and he rejuvenated and made better the production of Jintajan. So Kangxi period, porcelain is the best among the best and the most priciest. Now this, this piece has King Narai signatory. If you look in the middle, that's the chakra. Chakra is a weapon of Narai. So this is a a piece that King Narai ordered from Jin Zhejun. And in order to order, he has to wait about two or three years before the bowl would arrive back in the Yutia. Kangxi was always like to study. So it come to the story of family of Rose, um, because all the gift or the tribute that the Western nation has sent to China are very colorful. You know, the way of enameling enamel far, is far superior to the Chinese. So you have this, he said, then he told the Jesuits to bring back the technology. And in the 18th century, uh, China started producing the Wuxai or the family rose. And of course, the Tai Ben Jirong of the same period follows. On the right hand side, that would be a Yongzhen type of art style. And on the left hand side is a Benjerong Qianlong type of style. As I told you, Southeast Asia is the land of overseas Chinese. And we have become king in Siam. This is King Taksin. After um, the Burmese destroyed the capital of Ayutthaya, locally born Chinese of Taiju descendants become the king of Thailand. He rules for 15 years. In fact, he's not the only one. I've been telling you that history is very important because if you look at the same map, all over Southeast Asia, you have what the Malay call the local Raja. Okay, The local Raja is more in has more power and has more people under his control than the Chinese captain. You know, the founder of um, KL is only a Chinese captain. 
but this is you're talking about the Raja level. Okay? The green one is the Prince of Hatian. A lot of people nowadays know Prince of Hatian. Prince of Hatian is this Cantonese community that is based in Hatian, which control trade all the way down to the Kamau in southern Vietnam. The Prince of Hatian send tribute consists of gold leaf uh, trees to both the king of Ayutthaya, the king of Cambodia, and also the Nguyen of Vietnam. So they pay tribute. They, they give them some kickback, but they control the economic. And the area of Hatian, which was um, a late 18th century, was that big. Importantly, Baxin controlled the Japriya River. So that's a Beiju community versus the Hokkien community. Baxin actually extended, once he became king, he extended his power all the way to Nakhon Si Tamarat, or what you would call Liko. Another thing that people neglect was the Hokkien self-rule community down in Songkla. Um, the family name in Thailand now would be Nat Songkla, which means the Prince of Songkla, basically, you know, because they have ruled Songkla for over eight generations, from the end of the 18th century all the way to modern days. Once the king of Thonburi extended his power down, the Songkla community was given the governorship of Songkla, plus the exclusive right to collect all the bird nests along that coastline. So he made a lot of money, and every year he would go back and give King of Thonburi 10% that he promised the king as a payment for the concession. So we are going to be very fast up to Bangkok period. In the 19th century, it reminds us that junk trade and junk network is perilous. This is a um, mural painting in one of Bangkok's temples. And you know that the junk crew are full of everybody. Vietnam, Muslim, all <laughs> sorts of people get eaten up by crocodile and so on. Because the success rate is only 60% that you survive both going there and coming back to Bangkok. Early Bangkok period, through tributary trade, made a lot of money because the Thai king has the monopolistic right. But more important, we also have traders, you know? And why is it that Thailand made so much money vis-a-vis -vis the, the Malay lower down south? Partly is because we are a mainland power we are the rice field of Asia. You know, the reason why Ligo and Patani and Songkha doesn't make much money because they don't have a land backing to their supply. But Thailand has a vast um, collection of land to grow rice. And during the early Qing dynasty, China <coughs> prospered. There was an economic boom Accompanying the economic boom was the population explosion. So China couldn't grow enough rice for its expanded population. That's why you have the history of Ben Jerong, which reflects trade, which reflects power play in Southeast Asia, and you know, understand why Bangkok dynasty or Chakri dynasty rises from commoner to be able to order this gilded ware. If you compare the what King Narai ordered and what the Jakri dynasty ordered from China, this is a Rolls Royce class, and that was a Toyota class. <laughs> I mean, in terms of value of Ben Jerong. So, so that's very interesting. Now, King Mongkut with Rama IV, he is... Um, do you know the king and I? Yes, he is the king and the king and I, you know, the hero of Anna. Uh, once he ascended the throne in 18, 
51, the first thing he does is to send a tribute to China, which was refused. He couldn't go to Beijing. I mean, the, the mission couldn't go to Beijing because Taoguang Emperor passed away. They were contained in Canton. Then the, the year after that, he again sent tribute to China for recognition as the king of Siam. Uh, well, fortunately, they went to Beijing. Unfortunately, when they came back, the Siamese mission was wrong. And the interpreter killed. <laughs> and, and, and unfortunately for China, but fortunately for Siam, he dropped by at Hong Kong. And who does he see? He sees a John Boring. And the John Boring said, oh, in the modern world, you know, why would you be sending tribute to China? That is not modern. That is not the thing of our time, you know? And so, of course, the ambassador came back after being robbed. And from then on, every time China sent an envoy to ask for tribute, the king would say, oh, it's not safe to travel. <laughs> All the way up to Rama V, the Siamese has, has uh, refused to send the tribute to China. And that's why um, I'm lucky. Because he refused to send tribute to China, but he still needs Chinese goods. So instead of sending people to go and buy it from China, he used two tycoon which one of them is my family, the Gao family. So we can be very, very rich. <laughs> True, because we are the everything that the king of Siam needs. In order to, uh, 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 to buy anything, you need anything from China. Yes, you come to my forefather. And he would go there, buy everything for them. There was two firms that the, they buy um, good for the court of Siam. One is the Gao. My great-grandfather is this two young gentlemen. I mean, it's the same person. He's my great-grandfather. He is both a Chinese Mandarin and a Thai Kunang. So when he go to the Thai court, he would wear his Thai Kunang. When he go to China or he need anything, he would pop up his Chinese Mandarin thing. And that's his father. His father... Uh, actually, my great-grandfather is a third generation. The other one is a Lin family, and they have this uh, Jin Tang Fuji is that home house brand. My house brand is this one, Bao Zhu Li Qi. Basically, we do everything for, for both the king, the temple, the monk. So we make it very rich. But our product that we make more money out of is our export to China. Our export to China consists of rice. Our import in the, the ceramic is very light. It doesn't fill the junk. Actually, the junk is filled with laborer. You know, so you make a lot of money from laborer, from other product from China, and all. Yes, the travel. And he owned the first steamship that run between Bangkok and Hong Kong, the first Thai steamship. And all this is travel as a Siamese junk. So when the king doesn't go to pay tribute anymore, Thailand doesn't have any relation with China. Uh -huh. we, we don't have exchange, no government exchange, nothing. Nothing for a hundred years. Not until 1946, when the first Chinese ambassador arrived in Siam. So those um, hundred years, who contact the Chinese? It is the private entrepreneur. It is the junk master. It is the Chinese merchant. And hence, this talk is to pay tribute to all these nameless junk masters who ply the South China Sea and who basically carry out the relation between China and Southeast Asia.
Thank you. Thank you.